Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 14 and extending through the chapter, we come to the final church as far as the message of the, to the church is concerned in the book of the Revelation. Now we must remember that all seven, all seven of the churches received the entire message. Now it's just simply pointed out in light of these seven churches, the various circumstances and the various problems which were unique to each one of the churches. However, I'm firmly convinced that there were a number of other problems involved in the same churches. Therefore, all seven of the churches received the message whereby you have a full revelation concerning God's dealing with the churches of that particular time and those churches which represent for us the entire church age. They do not represent for us church history. There isn't anything as far as the context is concerned which verifies the various stages of the church from the beginning of Pentecost down through until the rapture. All seven churches represent for us the spiritual condition of the entire church age. Now then, when you come to uh, the church of the Laodicea, by virtue of the chronology of Revelation in the sense of being able to give a message, we often term this the last church, the message to the last church. Well, it's the last church in that it occurs in the Bible as the last mentioned church, the church of the Laodiceans. But the message for Laodicea is just as valid for the church of Ephesus, and the message for the church of Ephesus is just as valid for the church of Laodicea as any of the other messages are concerned. But in view of the fact that you come to the last mentioned church, there are certain things brought to our, our attention which indicates to us the completion of that message to the seven churches. Now I want you to follow along in your Bibles, and I'm going to read, beginning with verse 14, down through verse 22. Uh, these uh, uh, flies are a little bit uh, uh, pesty this morning, so just swat them along with me, and we'll keep moving around from one person to another person, and they can share each one of us this morning. So uh, you follow along in your Bibles, and I want to give you this little bit of an outline. First of all, we have the prologue. Then you have the problem, then you have the provision, and then you have the promise, and then you have the plea. All right, now let's observe. In verse 14, you have the prologue. And unto the messenger, or the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and the shame of thy nakedness be, uh, do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, and, he will, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit continues, or is saying, or saith unto the churches. First of all, the prologue in verse 14. You have the recipient and the revealer, as you have in the other six churches. And unto the messenger of the, of the church of the Laodiceans write, Again, a single mention of a messenger who is responsible for the message to the church. Now, I want to emphasize this once again. 
because you and I travel in circles primarily that um, in many cases uh, have an objection to the matter of a one-man ministry. All right, let's be very careful about some of these things which we hold to unless we can uh, verify them uh, in a dogmatic manner. Um, here, through, throughout the entire chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of the Revelation, you have a single messenger mentioned here. Not a plurality, but a single messenger. Now, um, uh, I am firmly convinced that there must be the exercise of various gifts as far as the church is concerned. But I'm stuck with the reality that as far as the seven churches concerned, representing the entire church age, you have a single messenger, isn't that right? We have to be confronted with that. So I don't believe that it, that it is a, a, a feather in our cap to come along and uh, to knock down uh, too strongly some of these very fine brothers in the Lord who are holding forth good messages of the Word of God who may be those that are the single messengers in that particular uh, local body of believers. So uh, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 has um, uh, simply caused me uh, to be a little more tolerant with reference to some of these things that uh, you and I often want to be dogmatic about. And I'm fully aware of, of the other portions of Ephesians 2 and uh, uh, Romans and so forth of the various gifted ones and as far as uh, Timothy and others uh, to the ministry of the church. Just remember that the seven churches representing the entire church age as a single messenger responsible for conveying the message to that, to that group. Now then, that of greater importance is the revealer. These things doth the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, you will be greatly blessed as you look at each one of these churches and see the caption that is given with reference to the revealer. You have many of these things revealed in the first chapter concerning the Lord Jesus. Now then, in this particular section, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, beginning the creation of God, I think you have some things here which are characteristic for us to uh, understand concerning the message to the last church. Well, I don't know about you, but these flies are sure enjoying me up here. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, these things set the amen. What do we understand by this word, amen? The Greek word is amen. Well, I'm sure that uh, that has crossed your mind, particularly in some places where after the singing of a hymn, why then there is the unison of amen and so forth. Well, this particular word simply means that it is, it is a confirmatory explanation. Confirming, if you please, that which has gone ahead. So what you have here, I believe, in the last letter to the entire church age is you have the Lord Jesus Christ, first of all, being emphasized that he is confirming Confirming the message to the churches of the church age, which relates to us right now. Now then, I want to go next to the last part here. The beginning of the creation of God. All right, here is mentioned for us that He is the great creator. He is the sovereign creator of God, along with, of course, uh, the Father and the Spirit of God, that the emphasis that He is the sovereign Creator. Now then, right here in this beginning, you have the Creator, that's the beginning, right? And then you have the Amen, the conclusion. How many times do you read in the book of the Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, I am the beginning and the end. 
Now, in between the alpha and the omega, of course, that's the first letter of the Greek alphabet and the omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, he's everything in between, too. Because now you have this, the faithful and true witness. Now, he couldn't help but confirm the great message, could he? Because you have the characteristic of his ministry. He is the faithful witness. He is the true witness. Now, I'm thankful that I have a revelation, if you please, for the church age, just in these seven churches. That which comes from <coughs> the one who is the beginning, the one who is the ending, and in between, he's faithful and absolutely true with reference to the message. Now, you and I must, absolutely must take heed to the, something that is, I believe, deadening today and that is we're having a very cheap very cheap sense of value to the revelation of the Word of God everything else goes in front of it our recreation goes in front of it our temporal possessions go in front of it our workforce goes in front of it. Everything is first place to the revelation of the Word of God. Now, folks, it's only fitting that he'd give us such a caption of himself for this last message to the churches because he begins to talk about that in no uncertain terms. If there's anything that we understand by virtue of the Revealer, it is the emphasis throughout the scriptures that in all things he should have the preeminence. Why? Because he's the great revealer. He's the great creator. And he's the one that confirms the whole thing. Now then, let's look at the problem that he brings to the fore with reference to the church of Laodicea. Characteristics, if you please, from the church of Laodicea right on through the church age. Well, we sure got it today. Just as Laodicea had it right in the beginning of the church age, we got it down here. All the way through, too. All right, now then notice what it says. I know thy works. How many times? How many times has he stated this? I know your works. I know your works. I know your works. And we have the idea that it relates to our conduct. Now, you just follow along here. And notice these things which relate to the caption, I know your works. The first thing, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. What is he saying here? Is he talking about their conduct? He certainly is not. You are. That is the second person singular of the Greek word Amy which denotes a continuous state of being. State of being. Now, the state of being results in a conduct, to be sure. But right at the beginning of what he has to say here is, I'm pointing out to you, I know your works, and your works are on the basis of what you are. I know who you are. I know what you are. I know you're neither cold, and I know that you're not hot. I know that you're not zealous, and uh, you're not frigid either. But now then notice. So then, because you are, this is what you are, because you're lukewarm and you're neither cold nor hot, I'm going to do something. I'm going to spew the out of my mouth. You know, this word spew means vomit. And it is the only occurrence throughout the entire Greek New Testament for this one word spew. It only occurs here in our Bible as far as the Greek New Testament is concerned. It only occurs this one time. And it means just what it says. I'm going to vomit you. I'm going to vomit you out. For one who is the Amen, the one who is the beginner of the creation, one who is the faithful and true witness, and everything else is I'm going to tell you 
because of what you are, you'll make me sick at my stomach. Things are rolling down there. Here's something nauseating, something that a true Lord, a sovereign Lord, a faithful Lord, he just cannot stomach. Now, I realize I'm using rather colloquial words here at this point, but sometimes maybe we have to get down to something that's colloquial for us to understand. You have a condition that makes me sick. Now, what is this condition? What you are, now please observe in verse 17, what you profess, what you say. All right? Because you say, because you say, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. Now, you follow along because I, I, I want to emphasize this for you uh, from the, the Greek text. It says this, Because you say, I'm rich. I have both gotten riches, and because I've gotten riches, I'm paraphrasing here now, because I have gotten riches and I am rich, I don't have need of anything. I don't have need of anything. Okay. Do we fit? You better believe we fit. I want to constantly go back to that portion of Scripture that we dealt with last Lord's Day morning. Apostle Paul said, the things which were gained for me, my prestige and my practice, superior. What things were gained to me, I count loss for him. And he broadens the spectrum. Not only what things were my profit, but then everything, everything, Placed alongside of Christ, I count them at refuge. Refuge. Dung, barnyard dirt. Ah, oh, since I have that sense of value, I have suffered the loss of all things that I might have the greatest prize. And that's the person of Christ. Person of Christ. The great confirmer, the great creator, the faithful and true messenger. I know what you are. We don't hide a thing. Not a thing. And I hear what you say, too. Now, we might not, we might not verbalize it, but we say it by what we show. You remember what I told you when I was at that little conference down in Kansas? As I spoke on a matter of dedication, which I think is one of the primary problems of the household of faith today. And I didn't have a ride over to the place that they were serving lunch. And I was standing around, and the brother said, you have a ride? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, hop in. So I followed him to his car. You know what I got into? I got into a Lincoln Continental. Now, I don't care whether you've got a dozen Rolls Royces. His wife and his daughter were in the car. 
And the daughter said, what do you think is the problem in our assemblies with reference to the message? You know, I didn't answer that. Her father did. Materialism. Materialism. I was riding in his Lincoln Continental, and he knew the problem. And I said, Brother, you're right on. That's the problem of Laodiceaism. Now, we were joking around in the garden uh, yesterday when we were picking beans. And uh, I forget just what the conversation was. Someone offering someone $100,000 for something. And I said, well, I wonder if someone would come along and offer me $100,000 instead of picking beans. And I said, I'd take it. Uh, how many times in the thinking of the household of faith today we set up before us the standard of materialism? And I don't mind telling you, as I told one of the leaders here in the North a number of years ago when I first started out among the assembly workers, he asked me what I thought one of the problems in the assemblies were. And I said, well, I'll tell you what I think one of your problems is. It's your materialism. You're proud of your money. You know, I've never been invited to speak in that assembly. It's one of the larger ones in the North. He's the leader. And I want to tell you, it's absolutely nauseating the caste system that's in the assemblies today, as well as a lot of the churches. If you don't have this kind of a home and this much of a bank account, and if you're not there as far as your executive position is concerned, you are nothing. That's Laodiceanism. Now, it doesn't mean just because you have possessions, you're a Laodicean person. It's not wrong to have possessions, but I'll guarantee you it's dead wrong to put your possessions, your home, your finances, your real estate, your securities, that's dead wrong. And what you do to the Lord is you make him sick at his stomach. It's a deadening thing. It's a deadening thing. It's a killing thing. And I'll tell you, I've been in the ministry long enough to see what temporal things will do to the people of God. You say, oh, maybe not verbalize it. And I've gotten rich. I, this happens to be a perfect active verb, which means, okay, I've gained it. And that's what I am, and that's what I'm staying. And because of that, oh, take your little spiritual faith business. Notice what he says. You know not that you are wretched. And you are miserable. 
and you are poor and you are blind and you are naked. That's just exactly opposite of what they say they are. Why, you, you poor people that are walking the faith trail. Look how poor you are. Why, you couldn't take six months off if you wanted to. And you can't go out on my 60-foot yacht, you can't even get a rowboat. Oh, listen, folks. No wonder, no wonder the Lord says, I'm going to vomit you out. Because what you profess is opposite to what you are. Your condition, naked, poor, blind, miserable, wretched. That's from his point of view. That's the problem. Oh, what a terrible problem it is. And to think that born-again believers are caught up doesn't do any good, does it, Gary? At home. Uh, to think believers are caught up with that kind of standard. Folks, you are the most blessed people in the world when you don't yearn after that which is the root of all evil. That's Laodiceanism. Quit using that as your standard. You know, I can take you to assemblies, churches, right here in the north where prestige and possessions are the standard of the acceptability in that group. One of the things which struck me in this locality now, in this locality, in attending some of these ministries was to contrast some that I saw that were looked up to as the leaders in that ministry in contrast to some of the poor group of people who had a precious spiritual life. What a contrast. I didn't say anything to anyone. All you have to do is just look. You can see. You can tell. Now, if I can do that as a sinful man saved by his grace, what about the one who's pure in every regard? Now then, from verse 18 down through verse 20, you have the great provision. Oh, what a provision you've got here. In light of that problem that he threatens to spew them out of his mouth, vomit them out. Again, you must remember, this is the only occurrence of this word in the Greek New Testament. I'm going to vomit you. And I'll tell you when, you, when you've got only one word used in that way, you can't miss its message for a minute. Now then, the great provision. Listen to this. Listen to this provision, if you will, please. I counsel you. Psalm 
It's a strong one. It's made up of two words. And when you've got a verb with a prefix preposition like you have in this case, it's intensified. I counsel you to buy from me. He's using terminology that will fit the circumstance of those who say they have gained riches and they don't have any need. They're perfectly well aware of what they can do with their money. Now I counsel you to buy from me. Where's the shopping plaza? Where's the mall you go to to get right with this kind of business? It's a person. The same person that the Apostle Paul went to. It's the same person that we're to meet around in the breaking of bread, table of the Lord, so to say. Lord's Supper. It's the same person that we're to walk through life with, abide in me. It's the same person that we look for from heaven. I'll come and receive it unto myself. It's the same person that you're going to be with me, with me forever. It's the same person that you might behold my glory. Now buy of me. Well, what kind of products am I to buy from him? Well, the first thing is you've got to partake of the very character of the person. Gold. Not tried. That, well, it could be a translation, all right, of this particular word, but it's, it's, it's a word that's used for refining buy of me gold that has been refined by fire. You see, when you come to me and get that which you consider to be of the greatest value, it is something that's pure. There isn't any dirt. There isn't any corruptible thing in that product that I ask you to come to me and obtain. And all of you are well aware that gold and scripture is that which is used in the Old Testament so many, many times that depict deity. Deity. Come to me. Come to me. Buy of me that which is true of my character. Nicodemus, you've got to be born from above. Nicodemus, you've got to be born out ek fa'u. You've got to be born out of God. Nicodemus, you've got to be born by the Spirit of God. You church, you folks at Laodicea, that's been caught up in Laodiceanism. You know what you need? You need a character and a being that's true of me. Come to me. Buy me. And then you're going to be rich. There's your wealth. That's right. And it is wealth that's not going to make me sick at my being. And along with that wealth, you're going to have white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. You have to partake of my being. You have to partake of my provision. And I'll tell you, you won't be ashamed in my presence. Now a righteousness.
provided by God unto all and upon all those who trust in Jesus. Born of God. You know, I've been quoted for us on a number of occasions with reference to that wonderful portion of Scripture. Come right on in, folks. Come right on in. We're just finishing up our Sunday school class. Come in and take a chair right down here. Now, in that, in that uh, portion of Scripture in 1 John chapter 3, what do we read? <coughs> Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called, what? The technon of God. That we should be the called born ones of deity. That happens to be an efficacious call, incidentally, for those who are acquainted with it. No, your Laodiceanism makes me sick. Won't you come to me and appropriate that which is true of my character, of my being, being born again of God? Won't you come to me? Won't you obtain the robes of righteousness that you might be clothed in white And that you might not be ashamed before me. Would you do that? Folks, spend some time. We can't go any further this morning. We're going to finish this next Lord's Day morning, Lord willing. But, listen. Laodiceanism, which is characteristic of the entire church age, had it there in the beginning of the church ages church, this to the church of the Laodiceans and you and I don't have to hunt very far to see how this very deadening devastating condition exists today among the household of faith and when the Lord and please remember please remember it this word only occurs once throughout the entire New Testament. I'll spew and he's to vomit. I'll vomit you. I'll vomit you. Folks, it's time for God's people to quit playing around. And to start appropriating the message from the great sovereign creator who confirms it all. He is the faithful and true witness of God. This is not a toy. Not a toy at all. is our condition, spiritual condition, making our Lord sick. Is it? You can do something about it. I'll just close. Verse 19. Coming back to it next Lord's Day. As many as I love, listen to that. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Now he says, be zealous and what? Repent. Repent. He said, I haven't pointed these things out to you just to hurt you. I love you. I love you. Repent. Now our Father, 
we want to thank you. And we want to praise you for being such a great, great Heavenly Father. Why you'd love us as you have, we do not know. There's no goodness in any of us. There's no merit that we have to present to you. And Father, there's so much profession today. Oh, I don't have any need. Arrogancy. Yes, arrogancy. Pride. Using the Word of God as a toy to try to support some of our prejudice. Oh, Father. What a despicable thing. Would you be pleased? to visit our hearts. And may the Spirit of God draw us to yourself in a new, loving, precious way. As we close this portion of our service, and our brother prepares to minister the Word in our midst in the next session. Father, Bless his own heart and minister your word. By the Spirit of God we pray. Amen.